love on steroids. Last week we talked about bodybuilding. We were talking about building the body of Christ and we said that a, a healthy, a spirit-filled church is one where everyone's using their spirit gifts that the Lord's given them. And a little bit more context of the, the text that we're going to study today is that Paul gives us 11 chapters of doctrine about how we were lost to sin and dead to sin and the wages of our sin was death, but the free gift of God was eternal life in Christ Jesus. So while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then he begins this chapter, chapter 12, and says, what should our logical response be? But to stretch out our bodies in obedience and offer ourselves as a living sacrifice. And then he says, he tells us to not be conformed, don't take the shape of the world, don't be like your neighbors, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And so it's got to start in our mind before we can love through our bodies and in a, in a present way. I, had, I knew a man who had three beautiful daughters, lovely little daughters, and he loved them so much, and he would tell me how much he loved them, but he also had an addiction. And so the addiction would have him in jail oftentimes. And I would visit him in jail, and he would tell me how much he loved his kids. But he couldn't love them well. And I remember talking to the, to the girls and saying, look, he loves you so much, but he doesn't love you well. He, he would like to love you better. And I mention that because we're talking about our love for Christ. And when we sing our songs, we emote our love for God and our love for Christ. And that's a good part of worship. But he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So we can love him a lot and not love him well, right? We can love him a lot and just live like, you know, take the shape of the world. And we're not loving him well. So uh, this kind of love only can be done by people who are being transformed by the Holy Spirit. If we try to do this on our own, uh, we'll, we'll soon be frustrated. We can't love like this out of willpower. To put this in context, I'm going to read a little bit the last slide from last week, and uh, I won't comment on it too much, but hopefully it'll remind you of some of what we said. Let's take a moment and ask the Lord to uh, bless this time in our hearing. Father, we thank you so much for the chance to gather here in the, in the freedom of this nation, and uh, we thank you for the chance to, to just look at your word. And we ask today that in some supernatural way, your word would speak to us and that our hearts would be eager to resonate, Lord. We pray that the kind of love described here doesn't discourage us, but encourages us to what you're calling us to, to the remarkable high calling. So we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ and by the power of your Holy Spirit, uh, transform us and renew our minds. Amen. So Paul then, after he says about all the different parts of the body, he tells us how we ought to love one another. And he says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, devoted to prayer, contributing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. And here's our new passage. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Check, please. I'm done. <laughs> this is too tough. This is too rough. Bless those who persecute you. That word persecute really means somebody coming after you with an intent to harm you. Anybody like that in your life? In the office? In your family? Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. This is a command. And, and it resonates with us because we heard it before. And like Derek read today, I'm going to read through this real quick. But I say to you, Jesus speaking, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you. Bless them. 
so that they may have be sons, excuse me, so that they may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. The trick here for Christians is the ones who are persecuting us are also our mission field. The ones who persecute us are also our mission field. So he says, pray for them so that you, so that you may be, oh, excuse me, pray for them so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good. He sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? How is that going to make us different from the world if we just love those who love us? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? He's left us here in this world that we might live a life that will point others to him. You might be the only Christ that your friends and your neighbors and your family ever sees. And so he leaves us here. He tells us in, in John 17 that he leaves us here that we might go out just as the Lord sent, just as the Father sent the Son, he sends us out. And he keeps us in this broken, fallen world so that we might live a life that is so transformed that other people will see it and will want it. I have this story I want to read. It kind of touched me. It says, uh, during the time of the terrible atrocities of Armenia, you know, there was, a, there was a genocide of Armenia before the Holocaust. And it was the Turkish leaders, a Turkish soldier pursued a young woman and her brother down the street and cornered them uh, and then mercilessly shot the brother and let the sister go free, but only after she saw her brother's brutal murder. Later, the woman was working as a nurse in a military hospital when the Turkish soldier who had shot her brother was brought into the ward. He was critically wounded, and if she had left him alone, he would have died. At first, she wrestled with, with the desire for vengeance, but she realized that the Lord wanted her to treat this man with kindness. So she gently nursed him back to health. One day the Turk who recognized her said, why didn't you let me die? She replied, I'm a follower of Christ. And he said, love your enemies. The man was silent for a long time, but finally said, I never knew that anyone could have such a faith. If that's what it does, tell me more about it. I want it. Those who persecute us are our mission field. So we want to keep in mind that the world is watching. And this is God's plan. Paul tells Timothy, indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. This makes me think, I'm not working hard enough. <laughs> We've had it pretty easy for a long time in this country, even though now we're starting to realize, hey, wait a minute, we should have been more vigilant. We're losing things. We're losing rights. And, and Christianity is being redefined as haters. But Peter and Paul and Jesus, they told us to expect this. Back to our text. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. The, this is just so hard on our flesh. Our flesh says, no, no, no. I got to get it back. I, I want them to suffer because they made me suffer. You know, it's a plot of so many movies that you see today. Early in the movie, the hero suffers some great injustice, and then he'll spend the whole movie is exacting his revenge and chasing him down. Ever seen a movie like that? It's satisfying when he finally gets them because that's what our flesh wants. But this is, God is calling us something different than what our flesh wants. That's why I say the only way you can love like this is by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're not going to do this on our own willpower. We're not going to count to 10 and do this. We have to have our minds transformed. We have to remember, wait a minute. When I was an enemy of God, Christ died for me. 
And so where we can see enemies of God, we've got to have eyes to see in faith. Hey, wait a minute, that person might be the next Paul who was an enemy of God, persecuting the church. Bless and do not curse. The temptation is to look at all the imprecatory prayers. They call them imprecatory prayers that David would pray in the, in the Psalms. And some are horrible, like have their children dashed on the rocks. And then we go, well, that's, I got a perfect prayer for you, brother. But that's not what we're, that's really kind of Old Testament. Then he says, be empathetic. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those, of we, those who weep. This seems easy enough. But sometimes our flesh gets in the way of this. Like sometimes it's hard. Like let's say you were looking for a promotion and your friend gets it. Rejoice with him. Maybe, you know, I got a little niece. She's younger than all her sisters. But all her sisters get married. It's hard to keep rejoicing being a bridesmaid. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Enter into, come alongside them, feel what they're feeling is what we're being asked to do here. And really, this is a work of the Holy Spirit. And weep with those who weep. I heard a story of a mom who took her little son to the funeral of her next door neighbor. And the wife had died and the father was there and, and the father was just weeping and no one even came up to him because he was just weeping. And so the little four-year-old boy went and sat on his lap. And he sat there for 10, 15 minutes. And then he walked away. And his mom came right up to him. What did you tell him? What did you say? He said, nothing, mom. I just helped him cry. That's a great heart. That's an that's a empathy. Because so much, you know, sometimes there's just things you can't really, there's, there's no words that will help a situation. But he, he had that mind of Christ. Weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind toward one another. And I tried to look that up and figure out what that really meant. And I think the best explanation of that is just regard one another as equal. Don't look up or don't look down, but look across and just have the same mind for everyone. Don't show partiality. You know, James talks about partiality. It, when you, you might remember James says, uh, if you break one of the laws of the commandments, you're a lawbreaker, you've broken them all. And he says, don't show partiality in church. Don't say to one person, sit on the floor, <laughs> and to somebody with a lot of rings and looks wealthy, oh, here, you have the best seat here. He says, that's a sin that'll break all the commandments. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not be haughty in mind, but associate with the lowly. Go out of your way if there's someone sitting alone, if there's someone difficult to love, if there's someone who society would cast out, we should run to those people. And Jesus said, as you do the least of these, you do to me. Jesus says, when you're throwing a party, don't just throw it for your relatives and rich people who you know they're going to invite you to their party. He says, when you throw a party, you invite the sick and the lame and the social outcasts who can't help you at all. And then your Father in heaven will reward you. But associate with the lowly. Do not be wise in your own estimation. Never pay back evil for evil to anyone. That means in the church or outside the church. Don't pay back evil for evil. That is our natural self. As soon as evil comes our way, we're already thinking up ways to get back. Never repay evil for evil. Think of all the heartache that we would avoid if we just followed that one command. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Heard a great preacher. He was actually a lawyer that was preaching. But uh, his whole theme was live life in a way that makes Jesus look good. Everything you do, you know, the way you 
keep your house, the way you keep your car, the way you love your kids and love your wife, everything you do professionally, everything you do, do it in a manner that makes Christ look good. I think that's what this means. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. Be aware of the cultural subtleties around you. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, be at peace with all men. Never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. That's a pretty strong word. Never. Never take your own revenge. It's Remember this. Make a note of this. Not to take your own revenge, but leave room for the wrath of God. Because in the very next chapter, and of course these chapters were added many years later, he says that he uses soldiers and policemen as ministers of his wrath. So we're not, this is, this is not, this is not a, a uh, dictate for judges or, or presidents or generals. This is for individual people. Never take your own revenge. Sometimes the law will do it. Take care of things for you. Lock them up for a while. But as between you and someone else, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. This is his jurisdiction. Your retaliation is meddling in what he's trying to do. And so we've got to just trust him in this. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, overcome evil, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now, it's interesting that if he's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. So if you see someone who's been persecuting you and they're in need, he says, meet that need. Find that tender spot in that person. And the best way to lose an enemy is to make a friend. But he says, in doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. And I read a bunch of different explanations of that. And I'm not going to walk you through them all. Because I think the best one is just that they'll kind of come under conviction. You ever do that? You know, you're trying to be mean to somebody and they're just being nice to you. Oh, <laughs> right? oh man, okay, I got to be a good Christian here, don't I? Right? So I think just by being kind, you know, the... Proverbs says, a gentle answer turns away wrath. But this is really an idiom. He's taking this from Proverbs. And uh, it's almost word for word for Proverbs. And it was an idiom in Proverbs time. That's 3,000 years ago. Nobody really knows what the idiom means today. But uh, as I've read different explanations, that was the one I thought was most plausible. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. I like the expression, kill them with kindness. So to be overcome by evil is to retaliate. It's to walk in the flesh. To overcome evil with good is to just respond the way Christ would. You know, we're not responsible for how people, what people do to us. But we are responsible before God how we react. Peter puts it this way. He tells us that we were called to suffer. For you have been called for this purpose, since Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps, who committed no sin, nor was there any deceit found in his mouth. And while being reviled, he did not revile in return. While suffering, he uttered no threats, but kept entrusting himself to him who judges righteously. This is what we do when we leave room for the wrath of God. We say, Lord, I'm just going to trust you with this. You're the one who judges righteously. And he says, vengeance is mine. 
And believe me, his wrath is going to be way more complete than anything you could concoct. And really, we should just keep praying that somebody isn't under that wrath. Someone said, if we could look into hell for five minutes, it would change the way we think about all those who we count as our enemies. Beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God. We don't talk as much about the wrath of God as I used to in the old sermons when I read them. And, and I think we pay a price for that. I think we're kind of a generation that figures, you know, everything's going to be okay, and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm in the curve, I'll be okay. But God doesn't grade with a curve, he grades with a cross. And we really want to take everything to him and have dealt with it before we stand before him one day. And, and that's what uh, communion is a great opportunity for us. In fact, as we move to communion today, I'd really like you to think about who's persecuting you now or who's persecuted you in the past. Saying a blessing on them, wanting what is good for them is really freedom. When, when we're mulling over and hating and loathing someone for what they did in our past, we're always in bondage to that person. This is a word of freedom. Lord, I trust them in your hands. You're going to pour your wrath on them or not. I trust them in your hands. I just want to bless them and let them be well. I want to set them free. I don't want to think, you know, it's so easy when somebody wrongs you to just repeat the wrong in your mind again and again and again and then repeat what you'd like to do back, what you should have said. He says, just be free of all that. In a way, life is too short for all that. And, and that seems really difficult, but with God, all things is possible. So when we remember, look, we were enemies of God. We were under his wrath. And he showered us with love and gave us his righteousness. And, and nothing that anybody could do to us would be equal to what we did to him. You know, all our attitudes, all our rebellion. Sin is just really rebellion in our heart and mind and actions against God. And he's perfect. And Jesus puts out that, that standard, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. And we all go, oops, I, I missed. This is the whole point of, of Romans 1 through 11, was all have fallen short of the glory of God. We're all very similar. And the difference between you and your enemy is really probably just a difference of an introduction to the Lord. So let's, uh, let's be mindful of that as we pray today. Uh, I'm going to ask the elders to come forward as we celebrate communion this morning. Ours is an open communion. It's open to all who call on the body and blood of Jesus Christ as our only means of reconciliation with God. Let's pray. Father, we ask that you would use these earthly elements for your high spiritual purpose. That somehow you will uh, work in us miraculously that with the drinking of this cup and the eating of this bread, we proclaim your death. We proclaim, proclaim your death that means we were lost and you took our sins upon you. And three days later, you rose from the dead and said, you have conquered death on our behalf, Lord. What a great celebration that is. And Lord, you leave us in this fallen world of alcoholics and prostitutes, the very people you came to hang out with, Lord. And so you're calling us to be with the lepers and the lost. And just as you came to seek and to save those which were lost, Lord, sometimes you bring the lost to our front door and it's more than we can stand. And the lost see our righteous desire to live like you, Lord, and it offends them. 
And so sometimes because we're trying to live your way, we find people persecuting us, people coming at us to, to ruin our day or make it more difficult. Lord, we think of brothers and sisters of Christ right now around the world that are suffering really probably the worst persecution since the first church. And it, it breaks our heart. But Lord, uh, so we're in fine company. And we pray, Lord, for them. And we pray that that kind of persecution isn't visited on us. But if it is, we know what to do. Bless and not curse. Father, only by your Holy Spirit can we react and respond that way. Only in our desire to love you back for the love that you gave us do we even have the mindset to do it, Lord? So we pray today that you would be transforming us and renewing our minds. And we call into our minds, I, Lord, someone who has persecuted us in the past or is persecuting us now. And we ask your Holy Spirit to empower us to release those people, to let them go, to, to let them go either for the wrath of God or that they might be blessed with a conversion and might become our friends. But Lord, we recognize that those who would come after us are our mission field. Help us to have that eternal perspective as we look at them and not think so small, think so petty as to how to get it back or how to give them a lesson. Lord, help us to love in this world in such a way that people say, I didn't know there was a faith like that. Tell me more about it. I want it. And Lord, we know we've fallen short of that. As you remind us about that, we invite your Holy Spirit to remind us about that. And remind us that, that we're no longer in bondage to sin, but we're under the righteousness of Christ. That right now, you have empowered us with everything we need to live a victorious life. There's now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus, but we're more than conquerors. Lord, help those realities to sink in that our lives would reflect it. So we invite you now by the Holy Spirit to search our hearts. And where we have addiction, remind us that we can have victory. Help us to seek out the help we need. Where we have a sin, Lord, we can confess. Where we've hurt someone, we can go and be reconciled and, and admit and confess to them. Lord, help us to live during this communion, after this communion. Help us to live in a way that makes you look good. And we ask your Holy Spirit to do this in us and for us, transform us. In Jesus' name, amen.